Welcome church family to Morning Manor, it's good to see you, I hope that you are having a pleasant week so far, uh, I hope that you've been faithful in the word, faithful in prayer, uh, I hope that the events of the week have uh, driven you back into the Bible uh, and back to prayer, those are certainly, um, that's certainly what we need to do, you, you've really got two options when it comes to, to watching the news, me and Harry were just having this conversation, uh, you can either watch it and get frustrated and aggravated or you can watch it and and pray, and I hope that you're certainly uh, being moved to prayer by the events uh, of the week. I want to encourage you to do continue to pray for uh, for our shut-ins, uh, for our sick. Um, I spoke to Miss Wilma Redford yesterday. She's had a, a bad couple of weeks, uh, hoping uh, to go to the doctor this week to uh, to be helped out. She was in good spirits, just physically uh, quite weak. So do continue to pray. Miss Wilmer. Continue to remember uh, Margaret Poston, Jeremy Peake, uh, of course Miss Wendy, uh, Natalia Lichty. Um, ask the Lord to, to strengthen those physical needs uh, and to minister spiritually as well. We're going to be in Romans chapter 3 verses 1 through 8 this morning. Romans chapter 3 verses 1 through 8. Continuing our study uh, in the book of Romans. This Sunday morning's message is from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 12 through 17. Uh, so if you want to spend a little bit of time uh, this week reading those verses and thinking about those verses, uh, there's some real gold there uh, for those of you willing to dig. So uh, 1 Timothy 1, 17, uh, 12 through 17 on Sunday. Uh, right now, Romans chapter 3 verses 1 through 8. Uh, I'm going to read those verses and then we're going to pray. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and that thou mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our uncircumcision commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil the good may come, whose damnation is just. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for a new day. We're thankful for a day, Father God, that you hold in the palm of your hand. We're thankful to be the people uh, who you have saved, who you have called out of the world for your own purposes. Father, we're thankful that in a day of uh, confusion and chaos, we know Christ. That Christ is our rock, Christ is our cornerstone, Christ is our hope. That the Lord Jesus has been made unto us righteousness and sanctification and wisdom from God. And Lord, I pray that um, there's so many things in the world that we trust in and hope in uh, for the way that I trust in trust and hope in you might be deeper and richer and fuller. Lord, would you do that in our hearts? Lord, would you do that in our church? Would we be a church shaped by your word and motivated by your glory? Lord, we do pray for those who are sick this morning. Lord, we ask for those recovering from sickness that you'd be with them. Father, we remember Natalia and Miss Margaret. We think of Wilma Redford and, and Jeremy Pete, Lord, we just ask that your hand would be on those situations. And Lord, we desire to be a people of your word. And we can open our Bibles and we can put our eyes in front of the text. Lord, only you can open our hearts and only you can um, breathe life from the word into our hearts to change our lives. So Father, we pray that you would. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder if you've ever been in a situation where things didn't quite work out the way you had planned. Have you ever been in a situation where things didn't quite work out the way 
you've planned, you've worked towards something or you've built towards something and uh, when that project was completed, you just wondered whether it was worth it. Maybe at work you, you spend time building a proposal and planning and dreaming about what this proposal would mean for your job and then you took it to your boss and he took it apart in just a couple of sentences. Maybe at one time you took a coupon to a restaurant and, and you, you had a great meal and at the end of that meal you presented the coupon uh, to your waitress and you discovered that because of the fine print the meal you thought you had was not covered by the coupon. Well maybe if you've been in that situation you can understand something of how Jewish believers, Jewish Christians reading this letter would have felt by the time we reach Romans chapter 3. You know by now hopefully that the, the Roman church was a church um, not split but demarked by two different types of Christian. You had Jewish Christians over here recently returned from the Roman exile. These were Christians who still took the Old Testament very very seriously. These were ethnically Jewish Christians who grew up uh, reading our Old Testament but on the other side of the divide you had Gentile Christians, Greek and Roman Christians who had no idea about Moses and Daniel and Abraham or the Ten Commandments. And Paul's burden in the early chapters of the letter to this Roman church is to unite this church by humbling this church. The first chapter Paul reminds all the Gentiles that they're sinners and without Christ they've got no hope. And then Paul turns to the Jews and he says they're sinners and without Christ they've got no hope. Chapter 2, it seems like Paul is just, just dismantling brick by brick by brick everything that Old Testament Jews would have hoped in. And of course Paul's genius is that he always seems to be anticipating the questions that his readers will have about what he's just said. Reading Romans sometimes, uh, reading lots of Paul's letters sometimes, feels like hearing one side of a phone conversation, doesn't it? Paul always anticipates the questions or the issues, or in this instance, the accusations that his audience are going to have once they've read his letter. So what is the accusation, what is the issue, what is the question that Paul's dealing with in Romans chapter 3? Quite simply, the issue or the accusation is that Paul has said there's no benefit or no advantage to being a Jew. Paul has said, uh, Paul is accused of saying that there's no benefit, there's no advantage to being a Jew, to being a, an ethnic, physical descendant of Abraham. We see him begin to answer that question in verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew? Paul knows that his teaching on the, the hopeless state of the Jewish people apart from Christ has uh, inflamed that question in, in people's hearts. They've said to him, well, what about the law? What about Moses? What about David? What about the Psalms? What about everything God has given us? Does that mean nothing? What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? You can see these Jewish Christians looking at Paul and saying, well, hang on, what about our ethnic privileges? What about our, our great ethnic backgrounds? What about our great religious ceremonies, circumcision and, and Passover and the rest of the feasts? This might have been a regular accusation for Paul in his ministry that, that he was attacking or condemning God's work in the Old Testament. For many Jews, their religious heritage was their religious security. We talked about that a little bit last week. The Jewish people were God's people by birth and the Gentiles weren't. And Paul is desperate to drag them out of that mindset. Paul is desperate to knock down these walls of, of religious security, of religious heritage, and get them to Christ. So is Paul attacking God's revelation in verses 1 and 2? What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there in circumcision? Paul says, much in every way. Paul says, no, there's loads of advantages. There's loads of privileges in being a descendant of Abraham. There's loads of, of privileges and loads of advantages in knowing your Old Testament. Paul says, chiefly, like top of the list, 
because that unto them were committed the oracles from God. The Jewish people were given God's oracles, Paul says. This is a great privilege. Paul is not attacking God's revelation. In verses 1 and 2, Paul says that he's, he's emphasizing it. He's magnifying the, the privileges of having the Old Testament. What does that mean? Well, think about everything that the physical descendants of Abraham had. Think about all the spiritual advantages that the physical Jewish people had. They had the covenants, they had the scriptures, they had the history, they, they even had the Lord Jesus himself according to the flesh. He was a descendant of Abraham according to the flesh like they were. They could not have had more opportunities. They could not have had more privileges. They could not have had more opportunities to know the living God. Paul says, listen, the Old Testament is not a coupon that lets you down. It's a signpost to the most glorious destination there can be. But it's just a signpost. In a few weeks, when me and Rachel uh, drive to the ocean for our, our summer vacation, uh, we're going to drive uh, down the highway until you get to the rural bit of North Carolina where there is no highway, and then we're going to drive down those back roads for a little bit, and then we're going to see uh, almost the best part of the whole journey, we're going to see that left turn sign taking us to the beach. But guess not, we're not going to park up under that turn sign, right? We're not going to lay out our beach towels under that signpost. No, we're going to follow that signpost. And Paul is saying, I'm not attacking God's revelation, I'm explaining God's revelation. The problem for the Jewish people listening to Paul, the problem for those Jews who did not accept Christ when he came, was that they had wasted the privilege of God's revelation. They were the most privileged people in the world, and they wasted it. And Christian, I wonder if the same thing could be said about us. I wonder if the same thing could be said about us. Not only do we have the scriptures in our own language, we have the scriptures in a multiplicity of translations, so that whatever translation of the, whatever English translation of the scriptures helps us to understand it the best, we can find it. Not only do we have a Bible, but we have dozens of Bibles in our homes, many of them collecting dust. Not only can we come to church, but hey, we can advertise our church services. We don't have to hide our church services like most of our brothers and sisters around the world. We can advertise them and we can invite our friends. Not only can we come to church, but so often we abuse and ignore and forget that privilege, don't we? And we let the smallest detail or the smallest inconvenience keep us out of the Lord's house. I wonder if we're abusing our spiritual privileges in the same way that those first century Jews had been. I wonder if you personally are taking advantage of all the great spiritual privileges that God has given you. I wonder when you pray for something, whether God is not looking at you saying, well, you haven't, you haven't taken advantage, you haven't grown in anything I've given you so far, so why should I possibly give you more? Don't complain about what God hasn't given you when you're wasting what God has given you. So, was Paul attacking God's revelation? Was Paul questioning God's revelation? Not a bit of it. But he was encouraging and even provoking those Jewish believers take advantage of their privileges, to use everything that God had given them for good. And sometimes I wonder if he wouldn't say the same thing to you and to me. Secondly, Paul was accused of questioning God's promises. Paul was accused of questioning God's promises. Look at verses 3 and 4 with me. Paul says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. We understand the question that Paul's answering in verse, uh, in verse 3, right? What if some did not believe, right? Jesus came and some people didn't believe in him. Does that mean, does that unbelief 
mean that God had failed in his task? Was that the problem? Is that what Paul is saying about the Jews' failure? This is the question that the Lord Jesus addresses in Mark chapter 4, isn't it, in the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower, sowing the seeds on the ground, some lands on rocky ground, some lands on thorny ground, uh, some bears fruit uh, for the kingdom. That parable explains all the parables. Because if Jesus has come, and Jesus is the King of Israel, and Jesus is the promised Messiah, why do people not believe in him? Well, this is why. Because only some seed falls on the good soil. So does the Jews' unbelief cancel out God's word? Paul says, God forbid. God forbid. Yea, let, ne- let, yea, let God be true, that every man a liar. The faithlessness of the Jewish people does not cancel out God's faithfulness. The faithless generation in the wilderness died, right? You know that story. The children of Israel are moving from slavery in Egypt to the Promised Land, and everybody in that generation, apart from Joshua and Caleb, died because of their sin. Now, God had promised that his people would make it safely from Egypt to the Promised Land. So, Did the sin of those people break God's promise? Did the people's faithlessness mean that God was faithless? Well, no, not at all. Because God's people still arrived in the promised land, right? They still got it. We can still say, and it's true to say, that God's people made it safely across the wilderness into the promised land. Paul says, let God be true, though every man a liar. Whatever Whatever problems we see in the world... And in our own heart, we know that they do not cancel the faithfulness of God. Christian, whatever problems you see in the world today, they are not stronger than the faithfulness of God. What is God doing in in 2020? From coronavirus to protests in the streets. What God, what's God doing? Well, the scripture tells us what God is doing. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. And a, a man's faithlessness is not stronger than God's faithfulness. The Lord is not up in heaven desperately trying to keep half a dozen plates spinning. He's not on the edge of his seat wondering which way this thing's going to go. God is continuing to work everything out according to his good purposes. Man's sinfulness does not conquer God's faithfulness. I know you're troubled by the sin you see writ large across our TV screens at the moment. I hope you're more troubled by the sin you see in your own hearts. That's a much bigger issue, right? Not the sin on the streets, the sin in your heart. That, that's the big problem. Uh, and here's the kicker, right? You can do something about the sin in your heart. And sometimes we just feel overwhelmed by the sin in our heart. Sometimes we just feel like, man, I'm so sinful, I'm never going to make it. I'm still dealing with these problems from years ago. I'm never going to make it. And as soon as I, as soon as I whack down this problem, another problem bursts up out of my heart. I find whack-a-mole in the fair. Friend, be encouraged. Your faithlessness, your sinfulness is not stronger than God. And God's promises will not be broken by you. God will keep his promise. Paul quotes from Psalm 51 verse 4, uh, at the end here of, uh, of, uh, of Romans 3 verse 4, he says, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and that thou mightest overcome when thou art judged. Whatever happens in life, whatever happens in your heart, God will be justified in God will overcome. So no, Paul didn't question God's promises. Finally, Paul, in these last four verses, Paul turns to the accusation that probably hurt him the most. And and this is an accusation, this is an issue that Paul continues to come back to. Really, um, Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6 are a digression that answer this Question: If you went straight from Romans 4 to Romans 7, that's the main flow of Paul's argument. Romans 5 and 6 are, uh, are a digression that, that answers this question that Paul keeps coming back to. So, so let's see what accusation got under Paul's skin. 
so deeply. Verse 5, But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my light under his glory, why am I also judged as why am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirmably say, let us do evil the good may come, whose damnation is just. You can see the reasoning behind this accusation in verse five. If our unrighteousness commends the righteousness of God, how can God punish us for being unrighteous, right? If, if our sin makes good God look good, how can God punish us for our sin? If grace is a good thing and we get grace through sin, how can God punish us for our sin? And Paul answers very quickly and very powerfully, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world. God is not unjust to punish our sins, because if God was unjust, he would cease to be God. God is not unjust to work against us when we sin, because if God was unjust, he would cease to be God. Paul asks the Jews, if they thought this through according to their own scriptures. God is the judge, and God must be just. Therefore, the judge is just. The judge is right. Therefore, God is not unjust to judge the Jews. God is not unjust to judge his people who fall into sin. And they need to grasp that. But this is such a dangerous teaching that Paul repeats it again in verse, verses 7 and 8. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie into his glory, why am I not yet judged as a sinner? Right, so it's the same question, right? If the truth of God is made known because people lie, why am I, says Paul's conversation partner, why am I also judged as a sinner, right? If my lies make God look good, how can God punish me for being a liar? This is what Paul thought, this is what Paul's opponents thought, thought he was saying. And, and that's why he writes all of Romans 5 and 6. Right? Paul, Paul's gospel was so free, the gospel is so free, grace is so free, that when we preach it sometimes, people look at us and say, well, then you think it doesn't matter how I live. Maybe, um, maybe, Last week in First Timothy, you, you you got some of that vibe, right? We talked about how God saves the uh, saves the commandment breaker, the murder of mother, a murder of father, the the the, uh, the perjurer, the liar, the whore, the immoral. And Paul looks at Timothy and says, "These are the people you've got to build a church with, because these are the people who understand what grace is." And maybe you left on Sunday thinking, "Well, so does not God not care how I live?" That's what Paul's accused of, right? Now, we know that Paul preached the gospel rightly because Paul was the inspired apostle. So we know the problem is not from Paul. But we ought to present the gospel with such freedom. We ought to present the gospel with such, uh, such emphasis on the extraordinary grace of God that people can look at us and say, well, doesn't God care how I live? That's what Romans 5 and 6, again, I know I keep going there, but that's what Romans 5 and 6 deal with. Paul says, listen, if you're, if you're alive to Christ, you, you're dead to sin. We'll get there in a few weeks. We see this accusation clearly in verse 8. And not rather, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil the good may come. Paul knows that people are slandering him and saying, Paul thinks you should do evil, the good might come. Paul thinks that you should sin so that you could get God's grace. But look at how Paul ends this verse. He says, their damnation, their condemnation is just. Friend, if your whole understanding of the gospel is that God has forgiven your sins so that you might sin as much as you want, 
Your condemnation is just. Your damnation is just. You've never understood the gospel. You've never tasted the sweetness of grace. You don't know anything about the Lord Jesus. If you think that Jesus died just to give you permission to sin, if you think that you can go on sinning because there's always grace, there's no grace for you because you've never been saved. There is grace for the sinner. Grace for the repentant sinner. Forgiveness for the Christian who stumbles and hates it. The one who thinks that, man, that the world is perfectly arranged because I love to sin and God loves to forgive doesn't know God and isn't being forgiven. Christians can't possibly live in sin once they've tasted how good God is. We can't possibly make peace with our sin once we know how good God is. Later on in Romans, Paul says that, that, that we were married to the law, we were married to sin, and now sin is dead. In Utah, every Halloween, Family. Utah's like a different country. If you, want to, if you want to leave America without leaving America, just go to Utah for a few days. Anyway, every Halloween in Utah, there's a big festival. There's that festival in the graveyards at the cemeteries, right? And people go and they decorate and spend the night and, and, and spend time with people who are buried. And it's absurd. But when a Christian determinedly lives in sin, that's what a Christian is doing. Heading off to the graveyard, digging up a grave and getting in the coffin. That's what it's like when a Christian sins. Digging up something that's dead. Christ has died for our sins. How can we live in that? If you think that sin is okay because God loves forgiving sin, you haven't learned the first thing about the gospel. The Psalms tell us that there's forgiveness with God so that he might be feared. We love God and we want to follow him, but we sin and it, it breaks our hearts and we hate it, so we go back to God and, and, God and, we, and we repent. And God restores us because God's grace is sufficient. That's why three times at the end of John's Gospel, the Lord Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Because three times Peter had denied him. That's why there's 12 baskets left over after Jesus had fed the 5,000 because there's, there's 12 disciples, right? They all need their own basket. God's grace is sufficient. You'll never run out of God's grace. But you'll only get it if you know God. And if you know God, you won't be comfortable <coughs> with your sin. So Paul is a man who trusts the sufficiency and the power, the life-changing power, God's grace more than anything else in the world. And we should join him. Maybe the problem in the church is the problem in America. That we're all just expecting the flesh to do what only the Spirit can. Only the Spirit of God can change hearts. But let's start with our heart, right? Only the Spirit of God can change your heart. Only the Spirit of God can conquer your sin. Only the Spirit of God can make the Lord Jesus taste better to you than sin does. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus tells us that the Father loves to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So let's ask God the Father to give us the Holy Spirit so that we might walk closer to the Lord Jesus, so that when we fall, we know there's sin available for us, we know that there's grace available for us, rather, but, but the tasting of that grace will make us not want to fall anymore. Let's know grace is power to say no to sin not permission to continue. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. Thankful that you are a speaking God. Thankful that you are a God who, uh, who loves us and is for us. Thankful, Lord Jesus, that your grace is always sufficient for all of us, for any of us, for the worst of us. But Lord, I pray that we would never be tempted to take advantage of that grace. That we would never make peace with our sin because of your grace, but that your grace would teach us to make war with our sin.
Lord, for those watching who have just settled into sinful pattern, patterns and are taking your grace for granted, Lord, would you, would you shake us up? Lord, shake us up like that soda bottle so that we might explode into the world, filling it with your love and your compassion for others. Lord, we pray that, that we would hate our sin, and that we would not be okay with the sin we see in our hearts, and that the sin that we see in our hearts would, would aggravate us and agitate us just as much as the sin we see on our TV screens. And Lord, we do pray for peace on our streets, Lord, we pray for, for justice to those to those who have been owed to. Lord, we pray that you'd make us wise to live in these days. Father, we pray bless us as we go in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, thank you for joining us for our morning manor service. Uh, let me remind you, we'll be meeting in person Sunday at 11. Uh, the state mandate for face masks continues, so we do ask that everybody wears a face mask. Um, when they're here, that's not a church thing, that's not a me thing, uh, that's that's just where we are in the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, right now. So please do wear a mask as you come on Sunday. If you don't have a mask, we have some available, clean and ready to go uh, for you. If we can serve you in any way this week, please do let us know. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing many of you on Sunday. Thank you.